Okay, I'm gonna use exactly what I show you. So that's why the introduction was super long in the previous talk. Uh, but I'm gonna use everything that I've shown you actually to explain what happened with collision. And so as a very quick recap, it's gonna be super fast. So the whole point I show you is that you have a discrepancy between phase and group velocity of the dissipative car soliton. And you can recast it, recast it in a single frequency, right? Like you see here. You have the linear mixing in this dimension. And basically, that means you have a two dimension, you have a two D, you have a two D comb that can be produced. So far, so good. But nobody asked me actually about the binding of the group velocity, right? Like you just assume, fine, group velocity is, is they are together, everything works well. Um, that's a very big assumption here, and most of the time, that's not true. Um, and actually, there's like many, many, many work uh, that has been carried by, uh, here at the work by Tobias Kippenberg, where actually, well, the group velocity is actually not binded at all, and actually you can either make them travel together, or you can just make them not travel together at all. So it's really something you can actually play with. Uh, and also, I told you, in, in, in the application level, you, you have like many, many things. And metrology, although we're very focused on at NIST, um, that's not the only thing in life. You can do much, much, much more with frequency comp. In particular, you have um, a lot of application where having multiple repetition rates using dual comb spectroscopy, for instance, uh, can be very interesting, but also for low noise microwave, for current communication, ultra fast uh, measurement, and all this kind of thing can actually harness uh, multiple repetition rate together. So, Dual comb actually has been become very, very, very huge, in particular because of the spectroscopy. And one thing that is very interesting about uh, when you have two repetition rate is actually you're going to alias it, which means that you're going to basically transfer your optical frequency comb into a microwave frequency comb automatically because of the aliasing, which means that if you actually have a spectroscopy that is in the optical domain, you can very easily measure it in the microwave domain. And it has been shown recently, and that's actually one of the reasons why we're actually interested about the, about the dual, kind of like this dual repetition rate, is that you can actually, with this aliasing, uh, a frequency division of the repetition rate. Which means, in this case, um, which is a very nice paper on Nature Come, I invite you to read it, um, you can actually um, measure your repetition rate indirectly because it's going to be divided by uh, the number of quantities that are, that are in between. But both of these systems uh, rely on, on multiple rings. So that means you have two solitons, they're independent, and you basically combine them only in waveguide, fiber, whatever you want. And most of the time, you have two lasers in this case, one laser in this case, right? Can you do it in a single resonator? Can you have two solitons that travel not at the same repetition rate in a single resonator? That's going to lead to collision, obviously. If you have one training the other, at some point, they're just going to collide because it just run around the resonator, right? That's not something new, that's something collision has been studied for decades. Uh, I'm only like testing the water now and there's way too much stuff about collision happening, uh, especially in the 90s and it's kind of amazing, but there's like a lot of things. And, and there's like this recent work, actually relatively recent work by uh, Keris Vallas group that's actually studied the, the dynamic of uh, dissipative car soliton uh, that, that can collide. And, and this work, it's, it's very interesting because they see a lot of dynamics. They see merging of heteronuclear DKS, that also has been demonstrated by Tobias Kippermack. Uh, they have DKS hopping, they have DKS that just vanish, uh, they have DKS annihilation when one uh, still, is still alive and the other one is, is killed. And basically, most of the dynamic of soliton collision has been observed in, um, in resonator. Uh, and, and that's really interesting, but most of this collision also has been observed with carrier of the dissipative car solitons that are very close to each other. That means like they are really generated as like one FSR away. Um, and there's this, so I, I didn't find the paper, I don't even know if there's a paper. If there's a paper, please tell me, that's Maxim that presented that at Clio. I remember that at Clio, I couldn't find the paper. Um, where I basically send a multiple laser, 1550, 1300, and he shows that you can have two soliton inside. And what he says is like, well, you can actually do spectral multiplexing of, of your soliton. And that, that's very interesting, but he didn't see anything relative to the collision. And that's kind of start to be interesting. That means when you kind of like put them to close together at the same carrier frequency, you obviously have like a, a very rich dynamic. But if they're far, far away from each other and they don't actually very much overlap, it, you basically don't see much, right? So 
as I say, collision in, in, in soliton has been something that has been studied since the 90s, and in particular because telecom. And soliton uh, has been huge for telecom uh, during the bubble uh, for propagating information. And as you can imagine, if you send multiple soliton at different repetition rates in the same fiber, at some point they're going to collide and might start to do some nasty stuff that can be uh, annoying for telecom. In particular, in this paper, actually, they highlight that the collision can yield for a mixing process. And so they go on and on explaining how they don't want that. And the point is like, it hasn't been seen in ring resonators. It's kind of like foil mixing uh, that results from, from the collision. So the point is like, can we actually see this kind of like dynamic that hasn't been observed in, in ring resonator? So quick reminder, the single frequency from uh, the soliton. So a soliton, you freeze the envelope, fast oscillation, drift at a different velocity because phase velocity is different from group velocity. So that means all these fixed points in the azimuthal uh, angle oscillate at the same period, therefore they're the same frequency. What if you have a soliton that, don't have, that doesn't have the same uh, velocity? That means you're going to have both these phase velocities that are different and the group velocity that is different. Same thing, we actually pick here points that are fixed in this phi domain. As you can see, they're going to oscillate, but their oscillation is going to be dumped, damped because of the envelope. So what you will get here, I only pick like one here, you're actually going to get the oscillation at a fixed frequency because of the discrepancy between group and phase velocity, but also an envelope, which means that if you do a Fourier transform, you do not only get one frequency, you, only, you get actually multiple frequency. That's very interesting because like if you, re if you recall the first talk, I told you, okay, like you have like one pump here, one pump there, you get an OPA, et etc. et cetera. What's ap actually happening if you have a dissipative car soliton that travel at a different velocity, group velocity, then your other soliton is effectively you have a multi-pump system at a fixed repetition rate here that is defined by the discrepancy of the two group velocity. And that's one of the five mixing I didn't mention in the previous talk. For mixing brass scattering. Brass scattering is like when you have two pumps. They create a modulation of the refractive index and essentially translate in frequency the signal into new idler on the other side of the pump. That's kind of like what you can see happening here. That means you're going to have like all this like effectively multi-pump system that's going to translate and create new idler around your frequency comp. So we can simulate this thing. I'll show you like the LED is working actually pretty well for all this stuff. We simulate using integrated dispersion, which is actually very close from the one that we measured. Pump it at 193 hertz, pump it at 283 hertz, so 1550, 162 nanometer, and we generate two soliton. They're in the same resonator. One here that is filtered, so you can easily filter them frequentially, so you can get like one or the other soliton, because they're kind of far away from each other. And what we see is like, when they're independent, they kind of like look like regular soliton. When they collide, you can see like, well, at the collision, there's like weird stuff. Definitely some phase business is happening here. But more interestingly, also like in the propagation. What you see here, you see these stripes of each of the soliton that create this modulation. It's kind of, it's kind of remind you of a breather, but the thing that is interesting is this kind of like stripes here are actually parallel to the trajectory of the other soliton. Same thing. Do extract it periodically every round trip, recreate your pulse train, get the get the frequency comb, and we plot in this like 3D type of stuff. And what you can see, you see like very well in this dark blue here, this second pump uh, frequency comb, the first pump frequency comb. Obviously, they have different repetition rates, so they are not parallel. But what you can see is also like there is like all these frequency components that are here and here. If we do the integral in this mu domain to actually get uh, the FCO of the system, you have the secondary pumped soliton has a lot of frequency component, like I told you, it's because it drift is, is moving at a different group velocity, so as, as expected. But this in red should only be one tone because it's a single soliton, so it's only, it should have like a fixed count of offset. But what you can see, you see all these different quantities that are appearing that are exactly spaced as the other soliton. Um, frequency spacing. So that's mean like throughout this simulation, what I show you is that the collision between two soliton, it's equivalent to a five mixing brass scattering 
in this phase space. Uh, that's kind of interesting because that means also like scaling up what I showed you before. That means if you want to inject many, 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 many pump, you do not have to have very, very many CW laser. You can harness this property actually and have different tools that do the same stuff. So why not? That's cool. I show you a lot of theory. What about experiment? Here, what we're doing is we're creating a single DKS at 1550. And actually, for reason to actually optically resolve better our result, we actually create a DKS crystal. So many solitons that are uh, tied together and just we fill it with soliton. Uh, here, there's 11 in the cavity, I believe, that are actually this uh, red line. And what you can see right away is like around this red line, you already have like some component, and you can already get there's some mixing happening over there. We can, we can effectively freeze, so that means we need to pick a repetition, right? And we're gonna basically freeze our main soliton. So what's gonna happen is like the other DKS crystal is gonna travel in the cavity at a different speed. Plotting in this uh, 3D domain, we see very well the primary comb here, fixed at zero, which is our like offset. The other one is a straight line, basically, uh, that has a different frequency, uh, different uh, group velocity. But what you can see already is like all the different idols. If you plot it, if you integrate over mu, like usual, what you will see, you will see in red the DKS crystals that, as expected, has different quantities. But in addition, the solitons that should be a fixed tone present other quantities because of the mixing in this uh, phase velocity uh, domain. You can do exactly the same by freezing instead the soliton crystal and not the single DKS. So basically, what's happening is you take this 3D plot, you just tilt it, right? And you're going to do the integrate over mu. So basically, instead of inte integrating over that dimension, you integrate over this dimension. That's what you're seeing here. And what you see is like you should have, you obviously have the single DKS that have new frequency component. So it on crystal should have only one. And what you see is like all the different components that are due to forehead mixing brass scaling. And if you really push it hard, that's the kind of comb that you're going to get. So you're going to get this kind of like interwoven. Um, it's kind of a fancy word. I'm not, an, I'm not a native English speaker, so interwoven was a fancy word um, that I learned uh, because uh, my girlfriend was doing knitting. Um, and that really reminds me of that. Anyway, but basically the whole point that is important is that in, in the output of your, of your frequency comb, that each comb, each comb tooth, will carry both repetition rates. On average, so that means not if you, if you take a snapshot at a given time, you will get this comb tooth carrying one or the other. But on average, each comb tooth will carry both repetition rate. So, can we see collision in a different way, right? So right now, I can like show you a lot of like, oh, it's equivalent for mixing brass scattering, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, right? And and so basically, what you see is like still this viewpoint in this phase velocity domain where like you freeze your decay, so it's a single frequency. You have the other one that has a different uh, group velocity, so it's not a single frequency, it's many frequency component. And because of, for a mixing brass scaling, case with non-linearity, you translate this, this T here into the other one over there. But if you think about collision, collision, I mean, that's like undergrad type stuff, elastic collision, where you have like one particle moving, the other at rest. Collide, if you have full transfer of energy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the red one gonna be at rest, and the other one moving. All right, now let's have a look of what happens if you have a soliton. One moving, one at rest. Let's say it's behave like a ball, a particle. This one's gonna become at rest and the other one's gonna be moving. What does that mean? That means this one, that's the picture that we're used to. One fixed one, one moving, therefore multiple frequency component. In the other case, that means this one becomes fixed. Only one frequency component. Here, let's say it's not perfectly transfer of energy, so it's still drifting a tiny bit. But this one is definitely moving. That means you have all this kind of frequency that start to happen just because we're not freezing, it's not moving in the, in the freezing referential frame. That's basically the same point of view. If you take into account the wave point of view, which is for a mixing brass scattering, or a particle that basically bonds against each other, you see the same stuff. And I talk about Fadiv. Uh, Fadiv made a lot of stuff. I'm done. I'm almost done. Uh, Fadiv basically talk about a lot of stuff about how this actually frequency are uh, the um, are basically the quantum state of a soliton, and that actually is the eigen frequency, and as, and that's mean like a soliton is the quantum field of light, etc., etc., and basically behave as a quantum particle, and therefore duality uh, wave particle. Um, that stuff that hasn't really been demonstrated experimentally, I believe. 
Uh, and so can we actually push it a bit further and actually use this type of collision to actually start to study this kind of duality uh, wave particle of, of soliton and KVG? And so with that, I hope that I convince you that the phase velocity can mix not only when you have group velocity binding, but basically all the time. And so that means you kind of need to take it into account, and that means if you introduce multiple pumps, you're going to have phase velocities that happen, and you can harness it into many, many, many different ways. Um, I hope I convince you also that if you have two DKS at two different FREP, that's essentially being the same as one DKS with many auxiliary pumps. And that means you can really scale it up very easily if you want to inject multiple pumps. Collision, we can very well do it with the early. The early seems to be very simple, but somehow it's very powerful. Uh, and we show experimentally the collision that result to five mixing using one DKS and one solid crystal. And so what's next? Can we use this kind of thing for metrology, three counter art, frequency division, all this kind of business? Can we do it? Uh, can we find an application for spectroscopy? Because all of a sudden you have like kind of like this area where you have a huge density of quantities. And because they both carry, both have FREP, can you do some aliasing and stuff like that? That can be interesting for spectroscopy. And like I discussed, can we push further for, uh, to see interesting physics, like wave particle duality, et cetera. And with that, I'd like to thank the people that work on that, Cardi, Pradiot, and Curtis. And all the chip I show you have been fabricated at Ligentech. That means if you have the money, you can make it. Thank you. Thank you.